Musical Truth Volume 3 by DJ Mark Devlin. Uh, the last video that I made on this channel was review of Musical Truth Volume 2. The first ever video I made on this channel was a review of Volume 1. And so now I'm completing the trilogy. Um, I've read the book, been through it, made some notes, highlighted some uh, important quotes. I learned a lot of stuff and uh, I felt like this book was a really fitting, powerful conclusion to the three book set. Um, it's it's great when you when you you know books famous trilogies Lord of the Rings. Um, that's about it. That's the only one I can think of right now. I'm sure there's many others. Space trilogy by C.S. Lewis. They they you know there's something powerful about a trilogy about a trinity, uh, and Mark has really nailed it with this being the final installment. It is extremely. Um, it's a tour de force. It, it's it's uplifting at the very end. It's got this kind of like strong conclusion that kind of lifts you up. And but before before that uplift, before that kind of optimistic note and, and crescendo of the book, he really takes you to some uh, eye opening and and dark and and, and crazy and wild uh, places, um, which are, funnily enough. Re represented to us uh, through the mainstream media that we all uh, music and, and pop acts and different genres of music that we all know and love and in many cases have grown up with um, so it really it, it's one of those books that changes the way you look at the world it, it adjusts your lens uh, and it gives you uh, a, a, a totally new way of perceiving things but it doesn't leave you bereft it doesn't leave you hopeless it doesn't leave you um, sort of thinking well now what what do we do you know, he, he, he gives you next steps and, and, and an uplifting message to tie it all up at the end. So for the next hour or so, we'll go through the book. I'll uh, tell you a little bit about what I learned, what's in it. We'll read some quotes uh, and then you can make a decision about whether or not you want to buy a copy for yourself or go and learn uh, about Mark and his work. He's a, he's a public speaker. He's a DJ. He posts music. He, he's written, uh, as well as this trilogy, I think one other book, which is a novel. So he's very prolific. He's very active. Uh, he's really working hard to wake people up and help people learn about the, the milieu that we live in and how many things that are familiar, many household names and, and songs that we know and love may not be what they are first appear. So let's get right into it. So when I bought these books, I uh, learned about Mark Devlin's work. He was a speaker on a, I think it was a natural law conference. And he's, he's from England, which is where I'm from. Uh, and I was surprised that I'd never heard of him. So I looked him up, found his website. He's got three books. Sweet. Got in touch with him, put in an order uh, and, and got them directly from him. So there was no cuts from the money he made that way you know that if he sells generally if artists or, or writers sell things via the big online platforms they don't make as much money so it's always good to go directly to them and get their product from them so that they can keep you know as much of the profit as they can and um mark he packaged the three books up for me sent them through and i asked him to give me a signature uh on them as well and write me a little message so this was back in 2022 he signed there and the message he's written at the top here is to nick nothing lasts forever including lies deception and tyranny and here's a really great message uh so i was really happy to get that and have them personalized to me um so first part of the book we kind of we get a lot of info about who mark is the other things that he does uh the cause and the cure is his novel set in oxford england in 1990 uh, the Sound of Freedom is Mark's uh, mixes of uplifting, conscious, awake music. And uh, I've listened to a couple of those, the most recent two, and they're really good. You know, once you've, this is what I mean about the book, providing solutions. It, it opens your eyes up. It's kind of like when you learn that a certain food is extremely toxic and you're like, oh, I can't eat that anymore. You know, maybe when you learn that, coca-cola is is incredibly harmful or or aspartame and diet coke is even worse uh, and you sort of have to give up this thing that you really love you know and it's hard unless you have something there to replace it and something else to lean on which might be something healthier like coconut water or just straight up carbonated water or i don't know so he he gives you he kind of raises your awareness about music and pop music and what it actually is 
uh, and then but he also provides you and points you towards music that isn't harmful or trying to manipulate you or plant uh seeds in your consciousness um so that's what his project um is all about the sound of freedom which is on mixcloud um there's also the good vibrations podcast where he's had a number of uh, guests on and uh, i think he's still doing that websites and then a foreword from the author and then he jumps right into it now this book came out in if i'm not mistaken 2021 and we all know that 2021 is, was the point in time where many things had changed um 2020 was when the big the change happened you know when it was initiated 2021 was when it was kind of still ongoing and uh, two weeks became had become a year and it was still ongoing and it was still strange very weird people weren't sure what was happening who to believe how scared to feel how much danger we were in and so the the, the first chapter right out of the gate chapter one COVID-19, the mother of all psyops. Um, so immediately what I really loved about the book was that he was broadening the scope and he wasn't just going straight into uh, the, the music and the, the different um, interesting aspects of the music industry that he covered in the previous two books. He was straight into the most important thing that i think's happened you know in in certainly in my lifetime and and as he says there you know he no 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 pussyfooting around he's, he's just telling you straight up what he thinks of the thing that happened and and then he goes straight into the um the evidence and the reasons why he's calling it a psyop and the reasons why he's calling it uh he's adding an n to the word there um and and it's incredible. It's it's a really good marshalling of evidence and other leads to follow up on and and uh, names to um, to investigate. Uh, and and I was pretty impressed with this opening uh, chapter because it aligned with a lot of the things that I learned. Being obsessive about gathering intel and asking questions and and hoovering up um, information with regards to the nature of viruses and pandemics and masks and injections and all these sort of fun things that we'll probably get a trigger warning on this platform for talking about but straight out of the gate he makes it known and there's a chat uh, paragraph here that i wanted to read because i think it um he made a really good point and this is something that i talked a little bit about in the volume two review um so we'll just dive straight into this quote i have made the observation in a handful of interviews recently that had the architects of the scamdemic tried to pull their audacious stunt back in the 70s or 80s, they would quite likely have been met with considerable public resistance and, quite possibly, armies of real men rising up to take physical preventative action. No such concerns were evidently in place in 2019, however, because the psychopaths knew that they had done a successful job over the past generation or two of both physically and psychologically emasculating men. Again, this would have been achieved biologically with hormone-altering chemicals present in food, drink, and the water supply, which have the additional gender-blurring effect of masculizing females as well as softening up their counterparts. Um, I don't know if that sounds controversial or weird or wacky or strange to you. To me, that is 100% the case. Um, I go to the pub with my dad and I talk to him about what his childhood was like growing up in this town where I'm living now, which is my hometown. And he tells me when he was a child, when he was growing up, everybody was fighting. It was, it was unavoidable. You, there were fights at school. There were fights outside of school. There were gangs roaming the streets. Men were out there doing man things. And then he got a motorbike and he was riding around in, in gangs on his motorbikes. And, and it was just... A more there was a more defined masculinity and i'm not saying that it's good to go out and get in loads of fights obviously but what i'm saying is there is a marked decrease in that i have another friend observed the same thing he's slightly 10 years older than me and he said the same thing he's, he's got two sons no fights hardly any fights when he was growing up fights all the time everybody was fighting and people would start a fight over the silliest 
nonsense things. This suggests to me that testosterone has been on the decline. And if you look at the testosterone rates, it's pretty mainstream knowledge reports come out year after year that the rate and the levels of testosterone and the sperm counts, in fact, have been on the decline for a long, long time. Uh, this also ties into a number of things in our food and, and, and foods that are pushed nowadays as healthy alternatives. And so I don't think there's anything controversial in, in this uh, paragraph. I think it's very much backed up and a very, very true observation that had we not been so softened up and domesticated and made kind of mushy and, and, comf and, and addicted to comfort, with our Netflix and our uh, home delivered food and our home delivered shopping, then I don't think people would have stood for the gross injustice that they did stand for uh, during all of the lockdowns, uh, because it was clear that the number of businesses being uh, trampled on usually small businesses, family owned businesses, uh, the number of children and old people who were traumatized and that's objectively true. There's there's no way to pussyfoot around that. Old people and young people were traumatized and irreparably and permanently damaged by these actions uh, that were taken, all in the name of a condition which has a 99 plus percent survival rate. And I don't think it would have happened if men were, were men. So one of the bits of feedback we got from uh, the last video was that people enjoyed uh, Mark's work on the connections between uh, public figures that are not made um, that that are not made explicit and well known. You have to do a little bit of digging to find out about them. And uh, there's another section here which deals with these lifetime actors, which is a phrase referring to characters who are there for their whole lifetime. You know, maybe my whole lifetime, maybe forty, fifty years even, and they've been in the public eye and they are rolled out at events and at specific times to perform certain functions because they have a massive influence. They have a big audience. Um, and so these lifetime actors are covered in musical truth. And um, Mark goes into a little more detail with more connections here. Quote, successive generations of these families are put to use in various prominent roles in society. The professions often differ from generation to generation but what the roles employed all have in common is that they have a strong influence on large numbers of people, particularly in conditioning them in their thoughts, perceptions and behaviours. The one-time nanny of Boris Johnson's family, for example, has said that when he, was a young, when he was a young boy, his parents would repeatedly tell him that he would one day be British Prime Minister. It was announced as fact, as if there was never any doubt it would happen. The Johnson family name is actually El Kamal, as Boris's grandfather hailed from the Ottoman Empire in Turkey. The family name was changed to Johnson to sound less Turkish and more British, though Boris was still saddled with the Depfefel as one of his middle names due to his genealogical links through his great-grandmother to an aristocratic bloodline coming from Bavaria, which happens to be the same region of Germany that spawned Adam Weishaupt's original Bavarian Illuminati and the family of globalist kingpin Henry Kissinger. Just as I was writing this chapter, an email arrived revealing that the actress Scarlett Johansson is a bloodline descendant of Nadezhda Krupskaya, the wife of Russian leader Vladimir Lenin. This put me in mind of the revelation that John Wilkes Booth the man said to have assassinated U.S. President Abraham Lincoln just happened to be an ancestor of Cherie Booth, the wife of U.K. Prime Minister Tony Blair. The connections never end. Jillian Maxwell, for instance, daughter of murdered Mossad spy Robert Maxwell and his mistress and mistress, sorry, to prolific child sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein, turns out to be a cousin of psychopathic eugenicist masquerading as nerdy computer boffin Bill Gates through his mother's line. Gates, incidentally, was a visitor to Epstein's private Caribbean island where the RAPE of many children is known to have taken place on several occasions after Epstein's affairs have been publicly exposed. Um, why is he not being investigated by police? It's a very good question, Mark. 
British Prime Ministers David Cameron and Boris Johnson are not only distant cousins of each other, but in turn are also distant cousins of Queen Elizabeth II. Thank God we live in a democracy and a free country where we get to choose our leaders, eh? Imagine if we lived in a dictatorship where we had no choice in the matter and they were just merely served up to us. Nightmare. And should we really have been too surprised to learn that Mark Randolph, the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix, just happens to be a great nephew of Edward Bernays? So one generation of an important bloodline is credited with having invented the subtle art of mind control through public relations. That's uh, Edward Bernays, who is himself the, I think, nephew of Sigmund Freud. While another sows further societal mind control through movies and television. Tom Hanks, whose name cropped up endlessly within the realms of alternative research in 2020 and beyond, and in some way very unsavoury contexts, has been identified by genealogists as having a dumbfounding array of famous connections in his extended family tree. One way or another, he is said to be related to US Presidents George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and both, both George Bushes, as well as actors Steve McQueen, George Clooney, also a prominent member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and Benedict Cumberbatch, who is related to mathematician Alan Turing, whom he himself portrayed in the film Enigma. William the Conqueror, both Queen Elizabeth's and General Patton. And not only did Hanks portray Walt Disney in Saving Mr. Banks, but he's also a distant cousin of Walt himself. Can anyone really still believe that actors achieve success and prominence purely through skill and talent? So a dizzying array of connections there. I don't know if they're all true. You'd have to follow them up and look into them yourself. But, you know, you could rewind that section, pause it and, and go have a field day researching this stuff because it is unbelievably interesting at the very least. And I just wanted to go back to this part about Boris Johnson being told that he would be prime minister one day. Um, it reminds me of an anecdote in Musical Truth 2 about Gary Newman who was told from a very young age that he would one day have a hit song about cars, allegedly, you know, um, but incredible connections. And what are the odds that all these famous people, all these well-known public figures who are paraded out and who are um, trusted happen to be related and interconnected through all these, you know, distant uh, relationships. It's, it's, it, the mind boggles and it really doesn't seem like it could be all be accidental. But I don't know, maybe you believe in uh, coincidences. Great quote here that is definitely worth getting on the record. And this is actually from the researcher, Jan Irvin, uh, who I believe has the Gnostic Media podcast. He says, it's much easier to spend a few hours or days or weeks researching facts than it is to spend a lifetime believing lies. Um, that's really a key quote and really sums up what I'm trying to do here. Um, you know, I th would really like to encourage people to get some books, read some books, underline them, make some notes. You can get a much better grasp of a topic or an idea or an event or a person by diving into books rather than, uh, you know, checking Wikipedia or something. Um, so yeah, a few hours, days or weeks researching facts is always going to be better and less painful in the long run. So good quote there, very much worth getting on the record. And so we'll swing it finally back around to music. This book after all is called Musical Truth, but the title is kind of misleading because you get so much more than just musical truth, as I think we've already seen. But um, in this chapter, uh, sorry, in this paragraph, we learn about a very, very well-known figure who is routinely rolled out uh, in front of our very eyes to uh, signal what are the good causes and the good uh, charities and the things we should believe in. Quote, steering back around to music, another good example of the bloodline dynamic would be the Hewson family. Researcher Johnny Vedmore, writing in an article for the Swamp website, has traced this bloodline back to one Johann Hewitson, or John Hewson, a merchant and land landowner in Yorkshire, England in 1498, during the reign of King Henry VII. His successor, Thomas Hewson, decided to relocate the family to Ireland in the 1570s, and so began a long succession of generations that worked their way into Irish nobility and high society. A present-day descendant of this particular bloodline is one Paul David Hewson, K-B-E-O-L. Born in 1960, 
and better known to the world as Bono, the singer in U2. Although he seems to have spent far more of his time hobnobbing with various world leaders and prominent elite figures and propping up various social engineering ventures in recent years than doing any gigging. Little wonder what with his one foundation having close ties to psychopathic globalists Bill Gates and George Soros. So it was never a question of chance as to whether Bono would become successful and well-known. It was seen to, by those parties who can make such things happen, that his career would be extremely high profile. Once he had established a strong degree of familiarity with the public, and more important, an adoring fan base who had come to revere and trust him, then his real work could begin. We've seen this dynamic play out so many times over the decades and it becomes easy to spot a key player or lifetime actor simply by keeping an eye on their extracurricular activities. Sometimes it can take years or even decades of cover before a candidate's true role becomes apparent. It can be this way in regular life too. Uh, it's a great point. You know, Bono is rolled out uh, to when we need to donate money and we need to, you know assuage our guilt that we don't do enough in life for the betterment of our fellow human beings. So send a few pounds, make a phone call, make a donation. You know, Bono wants you to, he's over in Africa, he's hanging out with children who are covered in flies and, 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 and if you just, you know, just make a phone call, send a few quid. It, it's, it's, it, it, you don't have to feel guilty, you're doing a good thing and then you can go back to, you know, your regular programming uh but why what does this guy know about any of this stuff um but yet time after time after time he's rolled out it's bono he's here um he, just an incredibly long career and i like you two i like early you two i went to see you two it was one of the first live gigs i ever went to uh, and it was fantastic and i have recently got their album rattle and hung i've been playing it in my car it's a great album um you can still enjoy the music but you have to admit that these people are built up and they're amplified and, and they're exaggerated to us. For what purpose and by whom? That is the kind of question you've got to be asking. And uh, Mark tells us after researching and writing three books on the topic, the more I research the industry for these books, the more I feel confident in making the statement that anyone who has achieved a level of fame and influence to the point that they've become a household name, is controlled and has had their career facilitated for them. I agree 100%. And I think I don't think it's always the case that, you know, I, I do believe that artists can come up with good stuff and they begin in earnest. They might be very creative. They work very hard. Apologies if you can hear the squealing children outside the window. Um... They work hard, they do the circuit, they put in the effort, they're, they're creative, they, they, they graft. They get to a certain level and at a certain point, I think they get, made it, they get offered a deal. And it's like either you accept this deal and enjoy the riches and the fame and the glory or you, or you disappear, you get forgotten, you become irrelevant. Uh, there are so many legends in music, musicians, circles of... Selling your soul to the devil. And this happens in the acting world as well. And I, I think there's something there's something there. If not a literal deal with the devil, then certainly a deal which is equivalent to selling your soul in that you are handing over all control. Everything you say, you do, you wear, you think um, is signed over to whoever, the record company and who runs the record companies, you know. Uh, and I think, yeah, and so, and I, I think there's a barrier there. And there's music videos with this truth encoded in them. Uh, there are many articles written online. Vigilantcitizen.com is a good website to read about this. Uh, there are pictures. There are TV shows. Um, it's a pretty common thing. And it's right there in front of you to see. If you can take the time to do the research, a few hours, maybe a few days, learn some facts, learn the language of symbols, and then you can start to read what these messages are. Are actually telling you in music videos and in uh, photo shoots and magazine covers and these kind of things. And so one of the things that I love about this book is that Mark Devlin uh, delves into the um, pop idols, musicians, uh, the, the, the public faces of music, um, their responses to the events 
of the of the last few years. And uh, this section is talking about uh, the the Gallagher brothers and how uh, Oasis um, the it was always presented as an edgy band. Um, and and in the previous book, he talked a lot about the Oasis Blur um, face off, which happened in the nineties. Blur being from the south of England, Oasis representing the north of England, and how these two bands were kind of pitched against one another with this sort of pretend rivalry, which is very reminiscent of, you know, WWF wrestling. They're kind of come out on stage and swear at each other and slag each other off, but then they're probably friends and they're probably, you know, uh, owned by the same companies and managed by the same people off stage. But uh, that there's more of that in, in the previous book. In this book, he's quoting uh, the Noel and Liam Gallagher's responses to uh, the lockdowns and all this stuff. So there's a great, great quote here uh, from Noel who ranted, quote, I will say it's a human right to decline the vaccine and the people who are virtuous signaling with their lofty wagging their finger at people who are declining it can F off. That's how fascism starts. When I sit at home and in between the football, there's public information films with Lenny Henry saying, take the jab, looking like an abandoned dog. I'm like, mate, you take the jab. It's up to you, end quote. Noel Gallagher's words, not mine. But I think I agree with everything you just said there. Although I didn't see Lenny Henry in the adverts because I don't watch television. Uh, Liam is also weighed in as well. And he, he uh, cemented his reputation as an opponent to the lockdowns at the time of a protest performance in front of parliament by around 400 artists to draw attention to the plight of struggling musicians, Gallagher posted a series of tweets related to the issue. Quote, so the dopes in government telling musicians and people in arts to retrain and get another job. What? And become massive cunts like you? Nah, you're all right. <laughs> Quote, this country would be beyond wank if it wasn't for the arts and the music and football show a bit of respect, you little turd. Quote, if anyone needs to retrain, it's them shower of cunts. <laughs> um, brilliant stuff from Liam Gallagher there. Uh, and the next uh, part of the book, we, uh, we learn about Ian Brown. So Ian Brown is um, lead singer and frontman of the Storm Roses, who are another band that kind of rose up around the, the era of Oasis. This section is called A Diss from a Rose. Very clever title. Um, and it's about Ian Brown's responses. Um, and so we learn about this. He says here, quote, Brown confirmed himself to be an artist with a social conscience, courageous enough to fully express his sentiments without concerns of how it might affect his career throughout the pandemic. He tweeted almost daily to expose this monumental scam designed to take away individual rights and freedoms and usher in the New World Order's plans to expose the agenda to justify mass injection as the only solution and to consistently decry government lockdown regulations as unscientific, cruel and unlawful. As if I didn't already like him enough, in February 2021, he endeared himself to me even further by tweeting, quote, I will never sing to a crowd who must be injected as a condition of attendance. Never, ever. Well done, Ian. And I haven't heard this song as well, but uh, Ian Brown put out a song called Little Seed, Big Tree. Um, in a few minutes, the song conveyed the truth of what the world was going through, along with a sly reference to Billy Gates, as effectively and memorably as a two-hour documentary or 500-page document could, with lyrics like, quote, Masonic lockdown in your hometown, Masonic lockdown, can you hear me now? From the top down, soul shot down, state shakedown, mass breakdown. Global orders riding over borders. Get behind your doors for the new world order. Dr. Evil and his needle. Dr. Evil with a master plan. Um, I got to go and listen to that song. <laughs> and so we've got a section here, which is about the uh, this idea of artists and, and performers selling their soul in order to, uh, to reap the rewards of fame and stardom and the riches and all this kind of thing. And, and this section is about James Brown. So in 2016, James Brown's son, Daryl, who himself had worked in the music industry, appeared in an interview with Sean Stone 
the son of movie director Oliver Stone. And incidentally, I reviewed Sean Stone's book uh, on this channel, which is called New World Order. Um, that's a great book too, but it's more history and geopolitics. It's good though. Two years previous, Daryl had published a book, Inside the Godfather. The same year, the biopic Get On Up had been released, with Chadwick Boseman starring as James Brown. In the interview, Daryl related the story of how his father had planned with Sam Cooke and Otis Redding to break away from the majors and create a distribution company of their own, and how this had resulted in Cooke and Redding's deaths. The parties responsible, Daryl claimed, had decided that his father was worth more to them alive than dead, so he was the only one of the three to survive. Sure enough, James Brown went on to put in another four decades worth of service to his overlords. It's not for nothing that he became dubbed the hardest working man in show business. Daryl referenced the fable of the crossroads as attributed to the legend of blues singer Robert Johnson and the concept of selling your soul for fame and fortune. When you look at the industry today, it's very demonic, Daryl observed. The way they place things, it just doesn't make any sense. He went on to acknowledge that his father had indeed sold his soul in exchange for his continued success and that he became a major money-making asset of the industry machine. Daryl stated that to the industry, artists are, like Barbie and Ken, their commodities. James had reportedly admitted openly that he had gone to the crossroads. This idea was reinforced by a short film commissioned for BMW in 2002 and directed by Tony Scott, brother of prolific director Ridley, who served as an executive producer. In it, a young James Brown is seen, Robert Johnson-like, at a remote desert crossroads. The caption advises that this is November 1954, the time when James, then 21, supposedly made his deal with the industry. Modern-day James's voiceover says, I traded sunrise for sunset. That's what I did. If I knew then what I know now, nah. Darkness is death's ignorance and the devil's time. The film then fast forwards to November 20, 2002, where an aging James is taken by his driver, played by actor Clive Owen, to a hotel named Crossroads. Once inside, he attends a meeting with an eccentric Prince of Darkness, or the Devil, played by actor Gary Oldman. James tells the Devil, I want to renegotiate my contract. The Devil replies, our deal was for your soul, for fame and fortune. Didn't I deliver? James responds. Yes, but the aging process, we didn't address it. I can't do the splits anymore. Our original deal no longer stands. The aging process has lessened my ability to perform. I can't maintain my fame and fortune. James then proposes a new deal, another soul for another 50 years, as he offers up his driver. The film goes on to show a drag race along the Las Vegas Strip and out into the desert between James and Clive Owen and the devil and his driver, hence the BMW relevance. James and Clive win the race with Ullman's car going up in flames as it's struck by a speeding train. At the end of the film, however, Ullman is seen to have survived and gets a visit from dark occultist and Church of Satan member Marilyn Manson, of whom the devil says, he spooks me out. Ten years after directing the short film, Tony Scott died of apparent suicide after jumping from a bridge in Los Angeles. James Brown eventually died on Christmas Day of 2006 at the age of 73, meaning that he, Cook and Redding all passed away in the month of December. The official cause of death was given as congestive heart failure resulting from complications of pneumonia after he had been hospitalized in Atlanta. Darrell, however, does not accept the official claims, instead suspecting that his father was poisoned. The claim that Brown was murdered goes way beyond only Darrell's personal opinion. In 2019, an investigation by TV network CNN and other journalists caused more than a dozen people to call for a new inquiry into both Brown's death and that of his third wife, Adrienne. So I haven't seen this uh, short film for BMW, but that is a massive amount of expensive A-list uh, actors, right? Gary Oldman, uh, Marilyn Manson, not an actor, but still big name, uh, Clive Owen, uh, James Brown. Uh, and they're telling you the story. They're using the words crossroads. Um, if you look up uh, Robert Johnson, uh, he has this song, The Crossroads. It's a blues song. 
uh, other mainstream uh, musicians who are very famous and successful, such as John Mayer, have covered this song. Uh, John Mayer has it on his album Battle Studies, which I've been listening to recently. And there's also a video of John Mayer performing Crossroads Live. And uh, at the moment that the song begins, the whole stage is lit in the color red. And that lasts for the whole song. And then the, the normal lights come back on. Uh, so you can check this stuff out, find it. The videos are out there. Um, spend a few hours to research the facts. See what you think. Further uh, incredible coincidences. Brown died exactly 10 years before George Michael, who turned up dead on Christmas Day 2016. In a never-ending labyrinth of curiosities and coincidences, George's birthday was 25th June, the date on which Sony label mate Michael Jackson turned up dead in 2009. 25th of June is said to be celebrated as anti-Christmas by certain satanic groups, marking the beginning of the sun's decline from its highest to lowest point in the sky, whereas conventional Christmas celebrates the opposite. Incidentally, Charlie Chaplin died on Christmas Day of 1977, as did from the music world Rat Pack member Dean Martin in 1995 and Eartha Kitt, famous for the song Santa Baby, in 2008, while those born on Christmas Day include the Pogues Shane McGowan, Annie Lennox and Dido. So a lot of people, uh, I think, tend to rely heavily on the um, coincidence explanation of things and you know even to the point where i think people really should be labeled coincidence theorists uh, there's only so many coincidences that you can become aware of before it starts to tip you more towards hang on a minute maybe much more of this is planned and much more of this is uh, being controlled and deliberately um, manipulated than we like to think um, we kind of get the narrative that everything in the universe is chaos, it's random, you know, it, it's sort of uh, an accident, it's, it's just random mutations causing things to evolve uh, and to get us where we are today. Um, and that is, I think, that worldview, and uh, I talked about worldviews in the previous video, but that worldview really accounts for why so many people fail to see connections and patterns between things that are seemingly unrelated. Uh, and this is what I learned recently is what's called systems thinking, when you can step back, look at the bigger picture and see how different things relate and, and connect in a way that gives you a much greater understanding of what's actually going on and what's, what's likely to happen next. And being able to absorb these coincidences and entertain the possibility that there might be more to them, there might be something significant about the 25th of December, um, and, uh, not beyond, you know, it's Christmas day and we eat Christmas pudding and give each other presents and get drunk, which is what we do here in England, pretty, pretty much. Um, maybe there's some other significance. Why have so many stars died on that date? It's, it's very strange and very interesting. So we've got a section here, which is all about Brian Harvey of East 17. Um, and he's always been close to controversy. Um, he's been sacked after endorsing the use of MDMA and ecstasy in an interview. <laughs> um, he was, he claims he was set up by a journalist though, and it wasn't his fault. Um, he'd already received a police caution for the possession of cannabis four years earlier. Um, he was fined outside a London nightclub, 1000 pounds for assaulting a press photographer. Um, and he uh, had a horrible breakup with Tash Carnegie, he was married to for five years. Uh, and then he announced that he was quitting the music business, uh, after which he was shortly jailed for 56 days after breaching an injunction taken out by his estranged, estranged wife. Now, before I even go on to talk more about Brian's story, and there is much more to say, this, um, this occurrence of pop stars having mental breakdowns is pretty common as well. Um, if it's so good to be famous and rich and wealthy and in the public light, why do they so often have these like astonishing public breakdowns? And this has been more common since the advent of the internet. People can take videos and share things much more easily. Um, is it 
is it just because the fame and the fortune is hard to manage and you've got all these temptation around you and you just lose control or is there something more sinister going on you know could it be that these particularly these young stars are as we mentioned before offered offered made an offer maybe there's a deal on the table you do this and then you can get that and maybe the thing that they have to do to get that is so traumatic is so degenerate is so upsetting and painful and torturous that it breaks them breaks something deep inside them which they cannot heal and it leads to further um breakdowns you know further down the line but to go back to brian harvey's story um in 2005 harvey was involved in a bizarre incident where he was hospitalized after being crushed under the wheels of his own mercedes it was speculated that this constituted a suicide attempt although harvey later gave the improbable explanation that he had felt ill after eating a load of jacket potatoes and fell from the car when he had opened the door to be sick uh, not even these events constituted harvey's most extreme brushes with controversy uh, so this next bit talks about his youtube channels and in these youtube channels and these videos that he's been making and putting out he's talking about consist he's making consistent references to the child sexual abuse that he says is rampant within the music industry and he's not the only one to make this accusation and make this claim uh, in fact I think this is covered in a previous book, but the um, rock singers Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington of Audio Slave and Linkin Park, uh, respectively, were allegedly investigating this very topic of child sexual abuse in pop music and, and in the music industry. They wanted to shine a light on it. They wanted to raise awareness, make a documentary. They both ended up killing themselves. Um, so... Brian is by no means the only person out there saying, making these kind of accusations and saying this stuff is rife, not only in the music industry, but also in Hollywood. So in 2014, he turned up at London's Downing Street and demanded to speak to then Prime Minister David Cameron. Some months later, he received an audience with Labour MP Simon Danchuk. The MP later called for an inquiry into allegations of child sexual abuse within the industry, commenting... Quote, he feels quite passionately about protecting children and really wants to make a contribution. We know that show business is an industry that's had a number of abusers within it. He's providing a number of leads that I'm keen to follow up. And that's exactly what I'll do. I'm pleased he's done the work he's done. So yeah, this industry, think Savile, you know, the most notorious, famous one, got a knighthood, was pretty chummy with the current um, king. Back to Harvey. Harvey's claims got the attention of multiple mainstream media outlets when in January he posted a video of himself titled Fuck the Industry 2, in which he's seen in an alleyway holding the plaque he had received to mark E-17's debut album achieving a million sales. Turning to the camera, he says, E-17, one million sales, here's what it fucking means. He proceeds to smash the plaque violently against a bin. <laughs> Great, I think that's exactly what should be done with all this mainstream record industry paraphernalia that we have clogging up our lives. Um, he added the message, one day you will all understand, but for now you can call me mad, nut job, loser, has been, whatever. But when you find out what's really been going on, I want you all to ask yourself if you could take it. Love to all the victims who were never heard out there. I'll be your voice. By early 2021, Harvey had released a multitude of videos and some becoming visibly distressed and apparently suffering mental breakdowns. He repeatedly told an anecdote of having been taken to a gentleman's club in Shoreditch, London by former EastEnders actress Daniela Westbrook. Uh, Harvey says she took him to the manager's office in the club. There was a concealed doorway which gave access to a warren of secret upstairs rooms all decked out in red decor with red lighting there's that color again harvey says he saw a young woman in the intimate setting with a man but the, upon glancing at her something struck him as strange about her exposed stockinged knee he later realized he said that it was too small to have been the knee of an adult and that she must have been a child harvey has spoken of how the image of the girl has haunted him and was the igniting spark that began his unwitting exposure to the ugly side of the industry in 2021, he also claimed that he had seen Gillian Maxwell in the club that night. 
which is pretty interesting given her connections with Epstein and his connections with child prostitutes and child trafficking. However, Mark tells us Harvey's claims uh, have been extremely hard to follow as he fails to present his points in chronological order or in any coherent fashion and frequently becomes distracted and sidetracked. So this is what you would expect of someone who's been through trauma. They're not going to be able to sit down and calmly, uh, coherently explain a story and a, from A to B to C to D to E like that. You know, memories become fractured, uh, emotions get tied up, things can be misremembered. It, it can, I imagine, I don't know, I, but, I, but I can imagine it's very difficult to get a sense of the accurate pictures of what actually happened from someone who's been traumatized. So, so the fact that his stories are very hard to, to follow and understand suggests that, yes, you know, that, that is in line with what would have happened to somebody, what somebody would be like if they had been uh, traumatized and abused uh, physically, sexually. Um, next, interestingly, uh, Simon Cowell. So Simon Cowell is somebody who Harvey, Brian Harvey named TV executive Simon Cowell. He's the host, uh, the owner of a bunch of record labels. He He's on the television show, uh, you know, Sing for Your Dinner or whatever it's called, where you audition people and you laugh at the ones that aren't very good. And then you pick one that is good and you have them compete and the nation votes on who they want to win. They get an album and then six months later, they're completely forgotten and it all happens again the next year. Simon Cowell's the guy who does that. I think he's famous in America, so I don't know why I'm explaining that. But he was uh, named by Brian, um, TV executive and f and former manager of the Pet Shop Boys. At Bros, Andy 17, Tom Watkins. Okay, so Tom Watkins is the former manager of those three bands. It was also named. Uh, so interestingly... Quote, Simon Cowell stumped up £50,000 of the £150,000 bail money for Jonathan King when King was first jailed for sex offences against young boys. Cowell's publicist, Max Clifford, who also managed Daniela Westbrook, is said to have been angered by Cowell's actions <laughs> and subsequently set him straight about what kind of man King is. I guess he was in a position to know since Clifford himself was sentenced to eight years imprisonment after being found guilty of indecent assault against several girls and young women. Clifford died in prison age 74. So, yes, uh, in, the ugly, in the ugly tangled web of vice and depravity, Harvey has, oh, excuse me, Harvey has accused campaigner Bill Maloney of pie and mash films of being a plant for the intelligence services and serving as a gatekeeper to prevent revelations of check child sex abuse at the hands of prominent people becoming public knowledge. This shouldn't even sound far-fetched at this point because of what we know and what has been publicly admitted uh, about Jimmy Savile and Rolf Harris. So bear that in mind. Speaking of which, I like this section as well, <clears throat> which is about the Smiths. Um, so the it's an it's analysis of one of Smith's songs. Um... So apparently he has a song, Last of the Famous International Playboys, which is an ode to London gangsters Ronnie and Reggie Cray. <clears throat> and he has another song, Suffer Little Children, which is a devastating examination of the crimes of Moore's murderers Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. It seems the Smiths frontman has never shied away from controversial topics or from addressing despised criminals. So, the story behind the 1986 Smiths single Panic seemed clear-cut at the time as the band freely offered an explanation for its hang the DJ refrain. Guitarist Johnny Marr recalled hearing a news report on BBC Radio 1 about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in Russia, then straight afterwards DJ Steve Wright coming in with a jolly tone and introducing Wham's I'm Your Man. According to Marr, I remember actually saying, what the fuck has this got to do with people's lives? Steve Wright may well be the DJ that the song had in mind, therefore. However, there's an alternative explanation, which is in the wake of Jimmy Savile's true sordid nature becoming public knowledge in late 2012, an internet rumor suggested that the song portrayed inside knowledge of Savile's crimes decades before everyone else found out. 
particularly ironic considering the Smiths performed Panic on Top of the Pops, which is the BBC show that Saville hosted for many years. The rumour pointed to the lyrics referencing panic on the streets of various British cities, but in particular the line, the Leeds side streets that you slip down. Saville hailed from Leeds and maintained a property near the city's Round Air Park. It was close to here that one of the victims of Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe was discovered, prompting Irish researcher Thomas Sheridan to speculate that Saville may have been Sutcliffe's accomplice in some of his murders. The pair are known to have been friends with, with Saville visiting Sutcliffe in prison. The lyric, on the lead side streets that you slip down, is repeated later in the song, followed by provincial towns you jog round. And as a side note, I put a uh, tracksuit because Saville was always wearing those shiny tracksuit things, right? And a, and a sweatband on his head, which prompted exponents of this theory to remind us that one of Saville's methods of getting close to children was to hide behind a facade of doing a lot of great work for charity. Bono? And in particular, undertaking many fun runs and marathons throughout the land. Uh, yeah, big red flag for anyone who is involved in philanthropy, especially if those charities are aimed at getting their hands on abused children or isolated children or children who've been uh, neglected, these kind of things. Morrissey sings, burn down the disco, hang the blessed DJ. Saville is credited with having been Britain's prototype disc jockey having pioneered the playing of gramophone records in dance halls as far back as the late 1940s, where only bands had previously performed. It has been noted that he was blessed by the Pope amidst, amid, amidst his various accolades. It's also suggested that of one of the song's more obscure lyrics, hopes may rise on the grass mere, but honey pie, you're not safe there. The honey pie part could be a veiled reference to pie, that's P-I-E, Pi, which is the controversial paedophile information exchange, a platform through which child sex offenders could communicate with each other and trade tip-offs to avoid capture, and the use of honey traps. A chorus of children join in the Hang the DJ refrain in the, in the song's final part, and the group featured a schoolboy on stage with them when they performed Panic on the Eurotube TV show. The Grasmere part seems more ambiguous, though a paedophile named Paul Evans, who was convicted of a string of sex attacks against young girls in 2014, had also been convicted of sex offences, resulting in a jail spell in 1990, four years after the release of Panic. His address at the time of the 2014 offences was given as Grasmere Avenue, Padium, Lancashire. In the same way that Johnny Rotten displayed inside knowledge of Savile's crimes as far back as 1978, could Morrissey have been demonstrating the same in an albeit oblique way some years later? If he was, the hang the DJ sentiment would not have been entirely misplaced. It is a crazy idea, like question about uh, how Savile was doing what he was doing and nobody was <clears throat> concerned. Or were they concerned? Did people know about it? Were they threatened or, or um, were they coerced to not speak up? Did they speak up and it was hushed up and, and swept under the, the carpet? Um, there's a part in this book earlier on where it talks about uh, the lead singer of Sex Pistols uh, and how he seemed to have knowledge about Savile's actions going way back. And he hinted at this in an interview. And then when questions said he thought he'd done his bit by, by mentioning it in that interview. So we're coming up on the hour now and I want to finish by telling you a little bit of what's written in chapter 11. There's so much in this book that I've had to skip over just to keep this video short. I could, I would love to read the whole thing and tell you about all the other nuggets that are in there, but I think you get a sense of kind of how close pop music and pop stars are to evil. <laughs> there's, there's, there's some crossover there and there's some deep, intimate, connection between those two things um, and it's not commonly known and it's courageous intrepid people like mark devlin who write books like this for us to read and learn and it's this the other thing i, I should mention is that every chapter comes with a whole list of resources which might be documentaries or uh, music videos or articles or further websites and books to to explore and 
and read about and go and check out. Um, that reminds me to uh, one book which I got off the back of uh, reading this was, I see that there, that's Altered State, The Story of Ecstasy Culture and Acid House. Um, this has got a quote, at last somebody has written, written the real history of the last 10 years. Irvin Welsh, he wrote Train Spotting. So this book is uh, was mentioned by Mark, uh, was published in 1997, and it's the definitive text on dance culture. So I'm pretty interested to get in there and uh, read that one. And the other one that I picked up as well, which uh, I just found in a bookshop back in Bristol where I used to live, was this, The Front Man, Bono in the Name of Power. Check out that picture. <clears throat> I mean, that that just tells you what a lapdog slave that man is. Look at George's adoring expression. He looks like he's going to give him a big kiss because he's so grateful of all the agendas that Bono has pushed upon an unsuspecting, trusting, loving, adoring fan base over the years. <clears throat> so that's The Front Man. Uh, another book that I'm excited to get into. I'll review on this channel at some point. So keep an eye out for that. All right, so let's bring this home and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about chapter 11. So chapter 11 is called The Best is Yet to Come. No, really. <laughs> and this is, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is, this is where the uplifting tied all together. Let's give you some hope and not only give you hope, but give you solid reasons and, and truth about why it's a good idea to have hope and to be optimistic and to not be uh, sort of deflated and beaten down by all the crazy stuff that uh, has been dangled in front of your face by the crazy controlling psychopaths of, of this place. Um, so in chapter 11, we got a few quotes to kick it off. One is a Mark Passio quote, huge fan of Mark Passio. Uh, Mark Passio quote, all is love, fear is an illusion, all beings are free, truth can never be destroyed. That's a really powerful quote. It's a good one to remember, especially when you're uh, in a tough time or struggling. Just, it's a good, good mantra to have. Okay, so let's get into this chapter. So this is from a section called In the Club. Quote, For millennia, religious orders, mystery schools, and secret societies have sequestered esoteric knowledge that has only been deemed worthy of their own initiates and have systematically hidden it from the masses who in most cases have been deemed undeserving of being privy to such teachings. This has either been on the grounds that they have been considered too ignorant and profane to, be, to apply it responsibly or in the case of the more malevolent organizations to allow them to gain a tactical advantage over the masses through hoarding empowering knowledge to create a strategic power differential. This last point I think is absolutely critical and I think is, um, in my opinion, you know, from what I kind of see and observe, the main advantage to, to hiding knowledge and, and, and keeping it hidden. You know, the, the people who run these lifetime actors and these pop stars and musicians, the people who craft, craft their songs and their image and tell them what to say when they in interviews and magazines and, and tell them what to wear in photo shoots, what hand signs to do. You know, um, if you go to the Vigilant Citizen website, you'll, you'll, you'll know what hand signs I'm talking about. If you flick through a few of the uh, symbolic pictures of the month's uh, posts that, he, that that person has done there, um, they're, they know what they're doing, the, these people. Not the people who are doing it, it's the people who are telling them to do it you know, the stylists and, and the, the music video directors and the, um, maybe the label, maybe the own, the music label owners and, uh, the people who design the sets, um, they, they know what the imagery means that they're putting in front of people. And they know that most pop music and most of this messaging and the symbolism goes out to young minds. And it goes out to minds who are not trained in recognizing what it means or why it's there and, and what it signifies. And, and this is where the power differential is created because they can implant ideas and, and feelings and impulses and desires uh, into your subconscious through a music video. Uh, now, if you look at 
lots of modern mainstream music videos. It's a lot of dark stuff. It's very weird. It's very, um, it's, it's very, a lot of a symbolism. There's a lot of, uh, I won't start listing all the symbols that are in there, but not a lot of it is feel good or uplifting or, um, what's the word? Kind of, uh, wholesome. You know, a lot of it is is kind of creepy and strange and uh, it's not designed to uplift people and, and make them aspire to great things. You know, it's it's designed to degrade. It's designed to get people into a really low base state of consciousness, almost animalistic, you know. I mean, <laughs> we want a good example. Go and look at uh, the song WAP. That's W-A-P, WAP. And just watch that if you can make it through the whole video. Uh, I, I certainly couldn't when I first watched it. Um, but my point is that these things have an effect. Look at the millions of views that these uh, videos and these artists get. Think about all the minds that, that these messages are getting planted into. Think about how catchy music is, how the lyrics get stuck in your mind and sort of become part of your vocabulary and your outlook on life. And you don't realize this unless you take the time, the hours, the days and the weeks to educate yourself, to read books like this, to check out the websites and the resources mentioned and to learn this language and to learn this symbolism. What that does, it makes you immune to it. So you can watch it and you can go, ah, I know what that is. I know why that's there. And it's a lot of bullshit and I'm not going to buy it. No, thank you. I'm going to decline your offer. And I'm going to go over here and make my own music, maybe. Or I'm going to go uh, to Mark's um, mix cloud and listen to some uplifting conscious music that has good messages, that has messages of creativity, that has messages of optimism, of, of, of love and cooperation and of bravery and of heroism and of all the good things that are never, ever given to us in the mainstream, we just never get this stuff that, that makes us aspire to great things. You know, we, we don't get that. We get like a lot of murder, a lot of deceit, a lot of sex, a lot of betrayal. It's just all garbage a lot of the time. So Mark goes on to talk about it's only since the advent of the Internet that aspects of this hidden knowledge have been shared around the world among we unworthy ones. The cat has been let out of the bag regarding the doctrines of these many disparate organizations. Freemasons have their distinct set of rituals, symbols, and sacred texts, for instance, whereas the Rosicrucians, Jesuits, or Opus Dei would have customs of their own. Yet the full picture only emerges when the various puzzle pieces are put together. This is a really great point. Um, so moving on a little bit, what all these groups concern themselves with is the true infinite nature of us spirit souls, our connectedness to source and the codes and actions by which we can live our lives to reconnect to what many would refer to as God, the creator, the most high, or the various other names which have been attributed to this divine power. This is knowledge which, if fully understood, absorbed and applied, can ensure that a human lifetime is not lived in spiritual darkness and ignorance but is used to its full potential in order for the soul to grow and evolve and take the knowledge it has accumulated back to source when it passes on. This is really on point, I think. You know, like I mentioned earlier, the worldview that everything is chaos, random chance, accidental mutations that have led to this, it, that, that means there's no meaning. In it. And it, for one, it's an inc incoherent worldview that doesn't make any sense. But two, if you have that worldview, then you have this feeling of, well, nothing means anything, so what's the point in doing anything? I'm not going to try to create beautiful things, make works of art. I'm not going to try to be of service to other people, to live a life full of love and compassion and empathy. I'm not going to try to uplift because pff, what's the point? We're all just molecules and particles and goo and skin, and, uh, and there's no design or intention or purpose to any of it but there is 
And this is what's this is really what is is being hidden from us. This kind of truth and and coming to this understanding and investigating it and testing it out and 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 applying logic to see well maybe this actually makes more sense. This worldview, not the worldview of uh, Bono and the child abusing satanic people who run the music industry and who tell you to go along with worldwide global scams and come on to uh and insist you take a medical procedure before you can attend their gigs or that you stand six feet apart and never hug the people that you love or that you traumatize children by forcing them to breathe through a wet piece of fabric all day long the majority of pop stars out there were on board with that agenda and that was a really evil agenda if you don't see that agenda as a really evil agenda, then you need to do some days, weeks, possibly months of research and learning facts. I just did a whole outro to this video and then I looked down and I realized it hadn't recorded. I hadn't been successful in my pressing of the record button. So I'm going to do it again. Um, there's so much more in this final chapter of this book, chapter 11. It's, it's, it's packed. There are... Um, what, what he does at the very end is he gives us a lot of uh, examples of musicians and songs and artists who communicate good information, uh, who communicate um, really not, not who, who are doing the opposite of what the Satan's servants are doing with their depraved, whop, meaningless, uh, empty, uh, vacuous kind of it's just soulless. There's nothing there. And, and, and there's a bunch of musicians who, who have done the opposite and who've tried to communicate the profound truths that uh, we just quoted and talked about and I hope were recorded. Um, I'm going to have to go back and check when I finish this. But the whole chapter is a really uplifting conclusion to a book that goes into some pretty dark places. And I didn't even touch upon the darkest parts uh, the, the, of topics and things that this book covers, um, you know, and, and there's so much more in it that I can't even do it justice in an hour video like this, but we have come to the end, uh, a little bit over an hour in fact, so maybe I'll have to find something to cut out. But anyway, that was hey, my review of musical truth volume three by DJ Mark Devlin. His website is djmarkdevlin.com. I would fully encourage people to buy copies of the book preserve them share them with friends it's, it's a really accessible way anybody can get into this stuff you know even people who are not at all interested in alternative news or or the truth movement or um any whatever label you want to put on it you know everyone has music in common nobody's cynical about music uh, and it's a great way to just get people thinking and looking at the dots and connecting things and uh, discovering some very amazing um, facts which uh, are, are just really not common knowledge yet the people themselves are very well uh, known such as Bono as we talked about in this video um, but the connections between them all and the, the, the sort of intrigues the um, the, the legends and the, the tales around uh, the deaths and, the, and it's all it's so interesting you know and I, I can't see anybody being sort of cynical about reading a book like this and it could really crack that shell of, of skepticism and rigid thinking where which so many people have where they just refuse to look at anything that is outside the mainstream and they're just they're they're all in on the mainstream all their eggs are in the mainstream basket and it's just well if it's not on the bbc i don't believe it and it can't be true it's just sad that some people are stuck there and mark devlin has provided us with wonderful tools to help unstick people uh, and get them on the on board with you know actual reality uh that is it i'm done I'm going to sign off for now and I will be back very soon. I'm going to be reviewing next something completely different. So keep an eye out for that.